Back to Job chapter 28 this evening. Job 28. If you remember from this morning, the, the question, the questions were very simple in Job chapter 28, verse 12 and verse 20. Piggybacking on this morning. But do people know where to find wisdom? Where can they find understanding? And then again in verse 20 of Job 28. But do people know where to find wisdom? Where can they find understanding? we seen this morning, we just talked about for a minute, about Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad, and their, their journeys to Job, and their supposed guidance and wisdom that they delivered, and it wasn't much of guidance and deliverance or wisdom at all. It was pretty much just humans given their, their insight. And in Job 28... Verses 1 through 11, if you remember, Job talked about can wisdom be found? Can it be dug up? Can you dig up wisdom? And, and he used some of these analogies and talking about you know, rocks and precious metals and treasures and, and animals walking over the land, and but below the animal's feet is, is, is precious metals and iron in the earth and gold in the earth and man's ability to shine light in the, deep, in the deepest, darkest parts of the earth, but yet he's, he's unable to dig up wisdom. He's unable to dig it up. And in verses 13 through 19, we, we see, can, can man buy wisdom? Is he able to purchase this, this wisdom that we're seeing in Scripture? Is he able to buy it? Is he able to to purchase it and no he's not able to even do that from 13 to 19 Job speaks of it cannot be bought with gold it cannot be purchased with silver but it's far worth more than all gold and all silver wisdom is the most valuable but everything else is is, is worthless when it comes in comparison to godly wisdom, to godly understanding, to godly direction. Wisdom is, is hidden from the eyes of humanity, and he talked about it, it cannot be even seen from sharp-eyed birds in the sky. They can't even discover it. And then from verse 23 to 28 in Job 28 this evening, from what we tapped on this morning and looked at this morning, it's God alone who understands true wisdom. It's the Lord God who has true wisdom. He knows where it can be found. For true wisdom is found only in Him, right? It's, it's only found in the Lord God. It's only found in, in, in who He is. As a man tries to seek and give his direction and give his ideas, it's, 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 it's really to no avail. And, and Job experienced that with Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad. He wasn't, he wasn't seeing and understanding true wisdom until he actually heard the voice of his Creator, the one who gave him life. God alone understands the way of true wisdom, it says in verse 28 of Job, or verse 23 of Job 28. He knows where it can be found. He sees everything under the heavens. He looks throughout the whole earth. For he is true wisdom. And if you remember 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, also from this morning, as Paul mentions. Paul mentions to his young protege in the faith as he's guiding young Timothy. He says, Timothy, true wisdom is found in Scripture. True wisdom is found in the words of God. It's found there. It's found nowhere else. 
It's found there. And in there you see, and in there you see Christ. In there you, you see Him. The beauty of Christ. The beauty of, of who He is. And for true wisdom comes from the Lord Jesus. It comes from Him. James makes mention about this in James chapter 3, verse 13. If you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. He's talking about true wisdom as it comes from the Lord God. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boastful and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, spiritual, demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind, James says. But the wisdom that is from above is first of all, it's pure. It's pure. It's peace-loving, James says. It's gentle at all times. And we and willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and kindness and grace. Godly wisdom is pure, he says. It's pure. It produces purity in our morals. It produces purity in our, our motives. Godly wisdom indwells our hearts. And indwells us. It directs us. When you live through godly wisdom, simply put, when you live according to Scripture, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding. A wise believer's life, if he or she's life is guided by, by Scripture, if they, if, they, if they long for their life to be guided by, by Scripture, they live in sort of a peace and, and rest. They base their decisions not on what they want, but they base their decisions on Scripture. They base it there. This godly wisdom that wisdom that we see is is sort of in direct contrast to to demonic traits that are described in verse 14, 15 and 16 of of James chapter 3. Demonic traits are is 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 bitter jealousy. Selfish ambition in your heart. Long to cover up truth. Boastful. Lying. Selfishness. This is not a godly wisdom. This is the complete opposite of godly wisdom. When you see somebody, whether it's in church or you see somebody outside of church and they're believers... Their lives are filled with a cover-up or bitter jealousy. and It's a life that is unspiritual, that is directed by self and directed by the demons around them. And the world, the Father is the devil, is directing and leading and guiding in that area. But for those whose life is pure and peace-loving as believers, gentle at all times, longing for the truth, a yield to others, a life full of godly fruit and full of mercy. Peacemakers, they long for the truth. They long for a harvest of righteousness. These are men and women who, who live according to the scripture. These are men and women who live according to the word of God. They live according to the wisdom 
of Scripture. Paul again in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3. You've probably read this verse many times. I'm going to jump up to verse 1 to get down to verse 3 in Colossians. I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea, Paul says. For many other believers who have never met me personally. He says, I, I want you to know how much I agonize for you. See, that's, that's, the, that's the agonizing of a, of a believer for the church, for people of the church, for other Christians. He says, I, I want you to know how much I agonize for you. It's a godly trait. For many other believers who've never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ Himself, He says. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love, by strong ties of mercy and grace. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plans, which is Christ Himself. And in Christ, remember, in Christ is found all wisdom. It's found all wisdom. In Him, listen, in Him who is Christ, he says in verse 3, hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I've said this before. When you seek wisdom, when you seek understanding, seek it through Scripture. Seek it through the Word of God. Seek it through Christ. Seek it through who He is. Not man. How do we know this is a foolproof plan? Because Paul just tells us in verse 3, In Him lies all treasure, all wisdom, all knowledge. It lies in Him. In Him alone. Back up to verse 1. This, this, this opens up why he said, I, I agonize over you. I agonize over you. I agonize over the church. I agonize to see that you understand that the treasures of wisdom and knowledge is found in not in their world of that day, but that it's found in Christ. And it's found in the Redeemer of the world. I long for this for you, he says. This is a mature believer. See, mature believers long for other, other believers to grow in their faith. and they, they desire to see that. Mature zeal believers, they, they long to see others grow in the faith. and They desire that. I always find it interesting that when I see a mature or, or, or a believer with zeal and love for the Lord as he or she tries to grow in her faith and are longing to grow in her faith and there's a believer who's not doing much growing at all, the believer is not doing much growing at all, it seems they become kind of offended and, and kind of they, they, they kind of look at it wrong but it's, it's, it's just what you're dealing with is two different, different levels of maturity and understanding and desires. Your Paul is one who's so strong in his faith and his love of Christ. And I've agonized for you. I agonize for you. And for the church at Laodicea. I agonize for them who've never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to corporately worship together, he's saying. I want them to corporately worship together all the time. Worship who? Worship one another? Worship the man behind the pulpit? No, I want them to come to worship corporately together Christ. For in Him 
is all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Him is all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6. For I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the truth. In Him is the treasures of wisdom and what? Knowledge. Christ says, I am the truth. I am ultimate truth. In me is all wisdom and all knowledge. In me is that. We long to learn so much in our world today. We long to learn so much. But yet it's sad to say that most know so little when it comes to Christ. Most know so little when it comes to the one who in Him is all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Why such agonization on Paul's part? Why such agonization on his part? Why is he agonizing so much? Why the concern, Paul? Why are you so upset? What's bothering you? What's bothering him? I tell you this so that no one will deceive you with a well-crafted argument. For though I'm far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in who? Christ is strong. Paul says, I I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with a well-crafted argument. So that no one will come knocking on your door and deceive you. So that no one will meet you on the, on the dusty dirt road and and bring to you a well-crafted argument. They'll deceive you. The last thing Paul wanted to see was those within the church being deceived. Being led astray. Led away. He longed to see them close to Christ. Close to the one who in Him is all treasure of wisdom and knowledge. He's seen the flip side of it. Paul already lived the flip side. He lived what it was to be, to, to live according to a well-crafted argument. He lived in opposition of the Redeemer of the world. He's done been there. He's, he's already did that. But by God's amazing grace, He he come to faith in this Redeemer, in this One who holds all wisdom and all knowledge. Remember what I said this morning. As Simeon in Luke chapter 2, as Anna witnessed, Simeon as Jesus the Christ was, was dedicated in the temple, Mary and Joseph and brought their child and Simeon raised Raises little Jesus and up, if you will, and the one who who holds all salvation, who holds all assurance, the one who is the treasure of all wisdom and knowledge. Paul says, "That's the one that saved me, and that's the one I want you to keep your eyes on." That's the one I want to keep. I want you to keep your eyes on solid. That's the one I, I don't want you to take your eyes off him. That's the one I want you to know more and more and more about. Second Timothy chapter three verse fourteen. For you, Paul or, or Timothy, must remain faithful to these things you have been taught. 
You must remain faithful to these things you have been taught. No matter how hard the suffering is, Timothy, you must be, you must remain faithful to what? To what you've been taught. The Holy Scriptures from childhood. For they've given you wisdom. They've given you understanding. You've received salvation. That comes by what? By trusting in Christ Jesus. Paul to Timothy. Paul to Colossians. In Jesus is salvation. In Him is wisdom. In Him is knowledge. In Him is all that that's spiritually, that's spiritually good. And God uses this to prepare us and equip us to serve. To serve Him for His glory, for His honor. For it's all about Him. At Colossians chapter 2, I tell you this in verse 4, so that no one will deceive you with a well-crafted argument. I pray that your decisions you make are according to Scripture in your life. Not every decision, of course, you know, or some things in life are just everyday living, but you know what I'm saying, decisions that, that require a, a, a spiritual understanding, a spiritual direction. I pray they're according to Scripture, where all wisdom and knowledge is found, for Christ is the author of Scripture, so that no one can deceive you with, a, with an argument. They make it sound so good. Paul was concerned because he was far away. He's far away. But his heart was with them. This past week I was with my brother and my sister-in-law and her daughter is going away to college. and She's leaving in a couple weeks and I can see the, a little bit of a weight in their face. On all three, my, my niece, my brother, and my sister-in-law, as, as this separation was coming, as this separation was right around the corner. She's only going two and a half hours of, up the road, I'd best, but it probably feels like two and a half states. Concern. Because they're not going to be there. And they're looking at it at, 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 as, as, at a worldly view through the world's eyes and there's such a concern. Here Paul is looking at it spiritually. Though he should, though we all should. For though I'm far away from you, my heart is with you. His care for them, for the church. His care for their spiritual well-being that they would never forget that, that, that spiritual wisdom comes through Christ and Christ alone. Spiritual knowledge is found in Christ and Christ alone. That they would never forget that living within them was the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding and directing them. I'm leaving but I'm going to give you another comforter. The gift of the Spirit of God and to guide them, to lead them and Paul was such a mentor, mentor, such concern on his heart and on his mind that they would always keep it right, that they always, always stay on the spiritual straight and narrow towards Christ, that when he wasn't there, they were on his mind. His care for the church. He says, I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. That your faith in Christ is, is strong, it's solid. Look at your faith this evening in Christ. How strong is it? How solid is it? I'm not, not here. It's easy to play the part, I've said it before. It's easy to play the part in church, is it not? How strong is your faith? 
outside the church doors. How strong is your faith? How solid are you outside the church doors? When it's just men, when it's just you and your buddies. When the attraction of the world is all around you. Women, when it's just you and your friends and, and the attraction of the world is all around you. Would it be said about you that your faith is strong and solid in Christ? Or would you be looked at as weak? Flailing back and forth and losing focus as to where your salvation comes from. And we just got done reading there and a few minutes ago in James chapter 3, just quickly the evidence and fruits of wisdom is peace and kindness and love towards one another and mercy and grace. I said it this morning, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, the greatest, one of the greatest of all acquisitions that you can ever, that you can ever receive is spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom. When you sit beside somebody who's spiritually wise, you'll know it. You'll know it. When you sit beside somebody who's spiritually wise, you will know it. Talking to somebody a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about somebody that they know, and person is not old in his, in, in, in his or her years by any means, and they said, "You'll know it. The spiritual wisdom when you listen to this person talk." They said it's 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 in a it's it's in, it's in a plane all of, of itself. How does that happen? Because he or she so saturates herself with Christ, the source of all wisdom. In Matthew chapter thirteen. Matthew 13. In verse 53. When Jesus had finished His illustrations, His stories, He left to depart of the country and He returned to Nazareth, His hometown. When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed. They were shocked. Amazed. Where does he get this wisdom? Where does he get this power to do miracles? And they scoffed. He's just the carpenter's son, and we know Mary, his mother, his brothers, James and Joseph... Simon and Judas, his sisters live right here among us. But where did he learn all these things? Such knowledge, such what? Wisdom. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. It was too much. It was too much for them. His wisdom was too great. Understandably so. He's the creator of the world. The redeemer of the world. Jesus' reply would be a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his own family. He would only do a few miracles there because of their unbelief. His wisdom was too much for them. Too much for them to, to comprehend. There's a well of wisdom out there. There's a well of wisdom. 
And the well of wisdom is found in Christ and none other. There's a well of wisdom and it's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. As I said just a little bit ago, wisdom only comes from Christ. For God alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found for He created it. He chooses to dawd out as He wills. But one way for us to gain wisdom is to gain understanding of Scripture. Back in verse 23 of Job 28, He alone understands the way to wisdom. He knows where it can be found. He looks through the whole earth. He sees everything under the heavens. Remember what I said this morning also. It's the fear of the Lord is the road to wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the road to wisdom. Psalm 111.10, Proverbs 1.7.9.10. Other passages throughout the scripture, you will find that the fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord, the reverence of the Lord is the road to spiritual wisdom. Job was looking for wisdom and he wasn't finding it in Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad by any means. But he would find it in Christ. Man's wisdom fails when it comes in comparison to Christ's wisdom. This is the wisdom according to God. This is the wisdom according to God. John MacArthur many years ago, he had a best-selling book titled the, the Salvation According to Christ. Another one, I think it was followed up or after that, or before that or after, he had another one, Salvation According to the Apostles. It just completely cut against the grain of, of, of the world's way of thinking what salvation was. And even the modern church's way of thinking of what salvation is. It took a lot of flack for both the books, but it was the truth. I say that to say this, that the world has its own wisdom. And it leads you down a path to destruction. But what we've seen here this morning and this evening is the wisdom according to God. His wisdom. The, for us, the fear of the Lord is, is true wisdom. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is what? Is real understanding. To forsake Him is, is a real understanding. Speaking of the fear of God and the highest of wisdom. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. He says this. Solomon says this. This is the whole story. Here now is my conclusion, he says. Fear God true wisdom obey his commands for this is everyone's duty so he goes through Ecclesiastes read Ecclesiastes if you never read Ecclesiastes read it just keep reading it it's 12 quick chapters read it over and over and over again It's basically simply talking about at times human wisdom and wisdom according to the Lord God. The whole story. Here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands for this is everyone's duty. 
So I was just sort of, so I've come to this conclusion. True wisdom is only found in my Creator. True wisdom is only found in my God. We're to judge, for God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. But we know, as followers of Christ, that He took our judgment upon Himself on the cross redeemed us through what He has done through His power and through His life speaking of the limits of human wisdom He says in, in chapter 7 verse 15 of Ecclesiastes I've seen everything in this meaningless life including the death of good young people and the long life of the wicked one wise person is stronger than ten leading citizens of a town. He says, I've seen wisdom from man and it's, it's gained nothing. I've seen it repeated over and over and over again, he says towards the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And then at the beginning of verse one of chapter 8 he says how wonderful it is to have wisdom how wonderful it is to be wise to be wise according to what how wonderful it is to be wise according to scripture how wonderful it is to be wise according to scripture remember human effort is a waste of time human effort is, is, is a waste of time and avails very little. Wisdom is looking as, as, as the Lord God sees it. Live your life through the way the Lord God would want you to see it. It will change the way you live. That's why it's so valuable to yourself to, to conform your mind into His direction, to His will. To have victory over your body. To control your body. To control your mind, your thoughts. To rest in the wisdom of Christ. When you finally rest in the wisdom of Christ, your ability to trust Him grows over and over and over again. And it's as if you refuse to, to live a life of fear. Job will get to the point to where he'll see that his trust must be in the one who is true wisdom and true understanding. His trust must be in Him and not in His friend's direction and not in His own direction, but in the very one that has chose Him for salvation. My prayer for you is that you too would learn to trust more in Christ, trust more in Christ more tomorrow than you have done today that you don't grow stagnant in your walk with Him. For if you're growing stagnant in your walk with Christ, your wisdom is not growing. But you grow more and more in Christ, and more of a thankful heart, a heart of adoration, a heart of praise, a fear of the Lord. For there, for there, is where wisdom begins. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, we love you and this time this evening is for you, for your glory, your honor. We love you to the highest. We praise you. Be glorified and honored.
bring us back Wednesday. We thank you. Lord, as we close this service out, and we close this service out, Lord, with a song of worship and praise towards you for who you are, our Lord, our God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.